Thank you for joining. Uh, today we have Rich from the British Red Cross with us. He's going to talk to us about humanitarian secondary data collection and analysis. He has a background in quantitative statistical analysis um, and has worked in a number of different humanitarian organizations, including OCHA, ACAPS, and now the Red Cross, uh, doing different activities related to uh, data analysis and operations. Um, this talk is related to, linked to some work American Red Cross is doing in terms of onboarding and in training volunteers to do secondary data analysis using the, the DEEP tool that has been developed uh, recently by the Federation and a number of other actors. Um, so, Rich, if you're ready, I'll let you take it away. Thanks, Dan. You've made me sound very clever now, so I'm a bit worried. Um, but yeah, strong intro. You can uh, write my next CV, that'd be great. So Dan said, yeah, secondary data uh, analysts and how we work with that isn't anything hugely new. Oh, I uh, hi. Um, isn't something new and it's been something in the sector that's been building and been talked about for quite a while now. Um, and I made the mistake of having a chat with Dan over dinner. So he asked me to do this talk about my experience with secondary data and how I've used it as an analyst uh, in my work. So I've tried to frame this around, uh, it doesn't go into too much detail and I'm assuming some baseline level of knowledge around stuff like DEEP as a system. Um, so I've tried to frame it around just really simply, what problem are we trying to fix with secondary data analysis? the benefits it brings and how it worked in sort of a product pipeline from my experience with ACAPS, which was a organization purely focused on secondary data review. Um, and then sort of my vision, which is my personal take of how we could use uh, secondary data within the movement to um, take it forward and really deliver some really interesting products in the future. Uh, I have a tendency to either say too little and end, end presentations really quickly or say too much. So Dan, if I'm overrunning my time, um, please shower me. Will do. And also, um, we have quite a, a wide audience here today. So when you get to the deep, if you could maybe just give like the 25 word summary on kind of what that is as well, that would be helpful for the audience. 25 word summary, you're gonna count. <laughs> yep. Okay, cool. Um, So I thought, I'd, I mean, Dan did that, my intro for me. Who am I? Uh, I mean, Dan's intro, so I'm basically sound very professional. Uh, but yes, I um, started out a few years ago, quite a few years ago with Ocha as an intern, uh, not being fancy there, just doing, uh, I was looking at regression modeling on how we could use um, secondary, how we could predict what information might come out at different phases in emergencies so we could plan uh, our response is slightly better in how we manage that. Uh, that didn't, there wasn't enough hard data to go from that uh, to really get strong conclusions, but we need uh, more information, better tagging, and uh, we would be in a stronger position. I then went on from uh, Ocha to work uh, with ACAPS for a year as, a, as an analyst, working with secondary data. And I'll, I'll talk a bit more of this talk, mostly focuses on ACAPS, but really what they did is their ethos was to push within the movement how we could use secondary data to really evaluate situations without having send teams on the ground and actually waste resources doing primary data collection. How a lot of the information is already out there if you have a structured approach for processing that analytical frameworks and potentially a system to do it, such as Deep, which I'll come to later, you can actually do a lot of uh, the assessments on situations remotely, especially the initial assessment and that sort of stuff. Uh, by just having people sat, say, in Geneva, reading lots of information, tagging it into a framework, and then analyzing it. Very qualitative based approach, but uh, it can be applied to quantitative as well. So I spent a very fun and exciting year in Geneva doing that. Um, I then went and worked with UNDP and OCHA in the Pacific, which was slightly not, I, I completely flipped. So I, I went from working with all with secondary data to, I went to the Pacific to set up their systems of how we could work with uh, primary data assessment, primary data collection uh, in very remote and inaccessible areas. So it was really interesting 
that it was impossible in that situation to use secondary data um, because there was no internet and no access to crowdsourced stuff outside of our ground location. But actually, if someone ex outside the Solomon Islands had been able to send us uh, that analysis, that would have been really useful. Um, and then more recently, I joined the British Red Cross and I've been working with them as an information management officer uh, in their search team. And this year, I've been in places like Afghanistan, uh, not Afghanistan, uh, Syria. I just really love Afghanistan. Um, in Syria, helping them look at their assessment processes and tools and how they could use DEEP to, one of the suggestions and recommendations from that project was how they could use DEEP as a system to centralize the wide range of assessments they are doing across all their different teams uh, in a secondary data review process. Their IM team could operate. And I would, then more recently was in Mozambique with the assessment cell on the first rotation of that. Uh, we did, we actually deployed uh, the deep remote team to do our secondary data tagging and a lot of very valuable information. I can see Luke's on the call. Um, Luke was our analyst on the ground and he was able to link into our remote teams doing that second data tagging to really bulk out a lot of the missing or information gaps we had from the field in our reporting, which was good to see. So that's pretty much me. Uh, this talk will focus predominantly on my experience of ACAPS because that's really where I worked with the secondary data as an analyst. So what is the problem? Um, there are many problems, but what is the information or data problem we're trying to solve with secondary data review is really there is so much data and information out there um, already, and there's so many different actors collecting and publishing reports on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. We don't always need to have our teams on the ground in a traditional way doing ground assessments, working out exactly, uh, or going and asking people what's going on. We can just stay at home, log on to Google go to Relief Web and find out what other people have already uh, identified as the problem or developing situation. Um, so what we want to do is do that in a systematic way though. If you went to your head of operations and asked them, oh, we're not gonna give you a report because there's loads of people already doing it. So if you just go and Google a lot of information, you'll find out what's going on. They probably won't be very happy with you. Um, so, what we want to do is set up a systematic process in which we can approach this massive pile of information that can be quite daunting and start processing it in meaningful ways uh, that we can analyze it. So there's basically the, the two steps are tagging and then analysis. Um, so by finding the information and exploring what's out there, we can then tag it into what's relevant and we can use something called an analytical framework, which I won't spend too much time talking about on this, but if you're interested, sign up for the HIAC, which will be happening in Europe or some other places in the future. Uh, AMCOS might run their own again, uh, because we really touch on this process within that training. Um, and an analytical framework is basically your closet for where you store different bits of information. Like what information is telling you what the situation is? What are the humanitarian conditions? What are the access constraints? And you basically start categorizing all that secondary information, uh, secondary data that's out there and putting it in boxes or put it in a closet, a uh, repository of useful information that then someone else or the same person, ideally in my, my book, the same person would be the analyst as well, can then extract that and look at, okay, so I want to know what's going on in Uganda uh, related to Ebola in this area. So they can use those filters on a system such as Deep, which I will, I will explain more very shortly, uh, or it, which is your repository or closet of information, and get an extraction of the useful summarized information for that area of interest. Uh, so it's basically a giant filter. Uh, what we're trying to do is create a filter on the world of information that is out there so we can process it and analyze it more effectively and provide that summary, that valuable snapshot summary to our decision makers so they can make more informed and effective decisions without having to invest huge resources in terms of deploying people and sending out assessment teams, which can be quite expensive. So that's the problem we're trying to fix. And I think we're trying to fix 
and it's been ongoing for a while now. I've, I've, I mean, I'm what third or fourth generation of the person who's uh, pushing this or promoting this as a as a tool, and it's been shouted about in the sector for years and years now. And it's slow progress. And one of the big adopters of trying to fix this problem was ACAP. But basically, one of the main reasons they set up was to try and ensure that this sort of process could be set up and work effectively. Um, and a lot of the original initial traction in moving this forward was done by ACAP. Um, so that's what we're trying to fix. And I think I touched on that a little bit, but what does it really bring to the table? Why, why bother? And I really want to just split this into two because I, I think there's real two big benefits to secondary data review. One is obviously the collective and how it benefits. I put the Red Cross here, but it could be the wider humanitarian sector, but also how it benefits yourself if it's something you want to engage in or something you end up engaging in. Um, so I'll go through that. So obviously, it provides information quickly. It's much quicker to, to spend six hours on Google or relief web trolling for information, tagging it up and analyzing that second data than it is trying to get someone deployed. I mean, it will take you, if you're really, really good, probably 48 hours, to, well, it would take BRC at least 48 hours to get someone on the ground before they could even start doing assessments and working out what's going on. So you can do, you can do it a lot quicker. Um, and I guess you could say you can do it a lot cheaper. It provides meaningful insight, and it really does. Um, I mean, I'll come back to I've got a good example, but I guess secondary data has often been overlooked or disregarded as not valuable or, or less valuable than primary data. But I think, and I think it's been demonstrated many times now, that secondary data reviews and secondary data analyses and reports have been used by decision makers to drive programs or drive operations forward and are more effective than waiting for that primary data to come in because it may be slightly less accurate, but you have such a wide, broad scope or you can uh, collate, uh, collate all the information from different sources and different perspectives that actually it ends up being quite uh, equally accurate as if you just deployed, uh, if not more accurate than sending out a primary data collection team. It's free data. I originally had it's free, but I just sounded like I was really cheap. I mean, I, I am from the north of England, and we are known for being quite cheap. Um, but it's more that it's free data. Uh, so that's how I rephrased it, that it's, it's out there. This information is already being put out by other organizations, by, well, not just other organizations, by ourselves as well. Across the movement, we put out loads of products and reports that just get lost in the world of um, the internet. Uh, so why not come up with a better way of actually using that? Someone's put the effort into creating it and it's valuable, so let's use it. Uh, it reduces the data we need to collect. So one of the really core bits of secondary data reviews, if you use it effectively and with a good analytical framework, it tells you what your information gaps are. So you really know what you don't know um, and what you do know. And then what you don't know is then where you can prioritize your primary data collection further research. Um, so you can actually be a lot more effective or efficient with your primary data collection if you have a strong team doing your uh, secondary data reviews and bulking out that missing information or finding what you need to find. Uh, yeah, and it does get better informed decision making, uh, which I've, I've touched on with the provides meaningful insights, but it does inform decision making. Um, one of my favorite reports I wrote when I was at ACAPS was I, I want to say 2017, I think it was 2017, uh, was the four floods in 2017. It was you know, uh, not a big, maybe an orange emergency. And we, we, we got the analysis done, the report out within nine hours of when we first saw the alert for that crisis and had a request for some informa information. And it was the only or core document the response agencies like the UN and Federation had to choose how they were going to respond. And for by days, it was a good two or three days before more or better replaced information was coming out for people to make decisions on. And it was just really, really good to see or rewarding to see that that report drove that operation in terms of the direction of do they scale up, what do they send and how much do they send. 
uh, at the HQ level and it added loads of value which wouldn't have been there if we hadn't done that second day review. Um, and that's all what the benefits it brings and it's probably more to say the movement or the wider network but even in yourself and I think this is where a lot of the value can come from as well. It brings the technical skills on how to be an analyst. Uh, we at BRC are having several conversations about the learning pathway and how do we train up and develop analysts to be more effective uh, along with other roles as well. And for me, one of them would be having remote analysts working in this sort of manner of tagging up data and writing reports um, as it teaches you and trains you on key analytical skills on a regular basis. And then that means you can develop those skills and take you forward and even then translate or transfer that into, into field skills or into your everyday job if you're uh, not working for the Red Cross or a different organization. Um, global insight. Uh, my favorite thing about ACAPS um, when I really did this was uh, I was very aware of what was going on in the world. I've never been so in tune with global politics and the conflicts and what crises are happening where and why they're happening, which, uh, which rebel, I can't call it rebel, which non-state armed group is doing what uh, and what the time and what their acronym is and what their new acronym is. It was just really, you were so in tune with what was going on globally, it was just really interesting. Uh, I really liked, it was the smartest I've ever felt basically. Uh, I really enjoyed that. The, it gets you humanitarian sector exposure for those who maybe don't work in it um, or a bit, a few steps away from it, it really does pull you into what is going on and how it works in different contexts with different organizations. Part of a network of experts, I come on, this is a, depends on how you, it was structured, but in ACAPS, how it was structured, we had a team, was 10 of us, oh, well, eight of us. Um, and really when you go through the analysis spectrum and you get to interpretive level analysis, it needs to be done in a group environment. So building a team of analysts who work together and collaborate, if it's remotely or in the same room, adds such a interesting level where it's not just your thoughts and ideas on a situation, you get to share that and test that and debate that with other people. Uh, and it really strengthens your thinking as well as you know, the analytical outputs. Um, but also, the, the last one which I've already touched on, is contributes to decision making and it's very rewarding. It can, I mean, it doesn't always sound very rewarding to say you're going to be a second day analyst, you don't get to do all the cool stuff like flying around a helicopter taking pictures of things. You know, you're sat in Geneva or like I am in Leeds, um, reading about a situation when you're not actually there. But you still are influencing decision makers and it can be a very rewarding experience and feeling to know that someone has taken your report and made operational decisions based on it, even if you were never near the operation. Okay, I'm over running on my time. Um, okay, so how do we do it? I, I changed this a little bit. Uh, this is how we operated at ACAPS, which is the most structured approach I have seen so, so far to date for secondary data analysis. Um, I'm playing with some ideas at the minute of how we will adapt this to have a similar process in the British Red Cross and hopefully real long-term planning to have a global network of people doing this. Obviously, in the Red Cross, we're, we're a network of volunteers, so we have to be structured slightly differently to ACAPS. We had eight permanent, well, not permanent, eight fixed-term contract staff doing it. Uh, so how do you adapt it is something I'm trying to work on at the minute, but this is how we did it at ACAPS. So one individual, one analyst, was basically assigned 15 global, 15 countries um, to monitor. These countries, normally 10 of which were um, non-crisis countries. So they were countries that were of interest and might have crisis developments occurring them, as in they, were, you know, they, were, they had volcanoes or earthquakes or they were on on a location what got hurricanes or they had some political instability which could escalate. So they were just there to keep an eye on. And then the remaining five countries were usually a mix of red or orange emergencies, um, stuff like Afghanistan or uh, Yemen were you know, two big ones. You know, uh, you'd have other ones like obviously at the time, Cox Bazaar was a, uh, a very popular with it occurring big crisis so that was another one of the big ones on people's radar so you'd all have a few major countries and then smaller ones below that to keep an eye on every morning i, I put this in the day but basically every morning uh you would have two to three hours every morning to monitor those 15 countries uh find out new information 
uh, and look for any any urgent developments in that country um, before you would have to do a morning briefing on that situation. I, how I used to do it is I would spend that morning not only finding that information but tagging it. Other analysts would do it slightly different and they would just find the information and then spend more time tagging it up uh, throughout the day. So then you would tag the relevant information into deep. And I will talk about deep now as I promised. So deep is a system that was built by a guy called Patrice and it was done in partnership with ACAPS in the early days. Uh, ACAPS has now actually stopped using deep uh, for whatever reasons they choose, but Federation has picked it up as a very useful tool and it's something that Federation is now really pushing for us to start using more and I would I support them on that rollout. And IMCOS is obviously looking at how they can use it now. Uh, so deep is basically a digital platform by which you can uh, find leads, they're called leads, which would be a document, um, and then add entries or tags on that lead. So you might find the latest humanitarian situational overview from OCHA on Afghanistan. You would add it to onto this, you would add it into Deep, which is a global platform, you'd like drag and drop into the platform. And then you would take extracts from it. So if there was a paragraph saying there was four million people in need of shelter, you could highlight that section and tag it as an entry uh, into the system. And along with other things you could do in deep, basically that would become a summary. So when you do an extraction of what is the situation in Afghanistan, it would give you those key bits of information that you have tagged into the system. That is a really, really basic summary of deep. Um, Oh yeah, and you would tag it into your analytical framework. So linking it back to where I was talking about closets earlier and putting stuff in the right boxes. Uh, Deep is basically a digital version of that. So you have your closet built into it. So those four, then four million people in need of shelter, you would highlight, tag, and put into your closet as unmet needs or humanitarian conditions, wherever is relevant to your analytical framework. And that's how it would be extracted. Um, so once you've done your morning monitoring and you're tagging at ACAPS, you would then have a meeting every morning, about an hour long, where you would bring any, the most recent and up-to-date or interesting developments in your country to the table. You wouldn't have to bring everything uh, across the whole world because that would be crazy. And then you would have to debate it with your peers, basically. Um, you would put it out there as, is this important, is this important enough to be shared uh, with the humanitarian community? And you would have to defend your arguments and the other analysts would challenge you on uh, the source, where it's from, how reliable it is, uh, is it actually a humanitarian condition? And you would also add the end result of that would be an action. So what you have to do based on that new bit of information, is it a snapshot? Is it a briefing note? Is it further research, basically? And that was the big core business of being a, being our Kairos, our analyst, sorry. And the other side of that we would do, that would link into a lot of things, but the big part was the quarterly country review. So every quarter we would review our country list for the whole world, which we had, would assign severity rankings. And we would basically review that based on the last quarter's tagging and what we'd been seeing in terms of the development. And that would be a bigger process where we basically reassign the, uh, the severity rankings in those countries on the last quarter's activities. From that, we would produce some products, uh, which I'll show you some examples. The most, which they've now changed again, but the most, the biggest task was the weekly monitoring snapshot, the global overview, which was basically a summary of all the activity, the summary of what's going on in that country in terms of the humanitarian context, normally broken down by sector and uh, geopolitics in terms of what the geopolitics are doing and affecting that country. Uh, and that was updated weekly for all our, our red and orange countries. It was quite a big task. We would also do bi-weekly situational watches. Uh, situation watch, which is quite interesting, was just a network meeting with all the other interagency actors working at IM, which was meant to be a collaborative way of sharing what we were seeing in terms of situational developments and what they were seeing. But it more turned into actually we were just doing a briefing to the rest of the humanitarian sector on what was happening in the world. So it was a way we could basically uh, yeah, have a different platform to share our information in a vocal way. It was quite, it was really interesting and fun thing to do. 
ad hoc initial, initial situation assessments. So briefly notes, the one from the pool I was talking about, that's an example. So if a flood happened uh, or a major event happened in Afghanistan or Yemen, we might do an ad hoc, more detailed initial assessment uh, where we take all the data, really focus on that specific event and write an analysis of what was going on. Um, that what was new and something we were really pushing when I was there was the ad hoc scenario or scenario planning or anticipatory briefing notes, which was really looking at what we were seeing was happening and trying to do forecasting and predicting how these different situations might develop into different scenarios, um, which is now something that ACAPS are doing a lot more of uh, and was quite new when we were there. And it's a really interesting thing that I think the movement could do a lot more of using tools like this. And the other, which is sort of indirectly creates, you get a deep country data bank. So by doing your morning tagging, um, you fit populate that country's deep section um, with information. So anyone else who is interested to so our program teams or whatever, who may be not writing a snapshot or doing what we're doing, but still want the raw data can do, do whatever filter is relevant to them and extract that data to use for whatever they want to use. Uh, which is a hugely valuable product and actually shouldn't be at the bottom. Um, but it's, uh, I guess it's not a front facing product, it's more of an intermediary use, it's more of a tool than a, than a product itself. So, what does that really look like? I realize I'm sort of rambling too much as I promised I wouldn't. This is what a global overview today looks like for ACAPS. It was slightly different back then, but you can see that crisis severity is what I was talking about. We would through the secondary data process and using deep we would come up with a, a score based on our methodology if you've got an ACAPS you can see the methodology they use um, and that would be updated weekly but reviewed um, for change if it jumped up a level or not every every quarter access was another one we've focused a lot on trying to work out what access situations were in countries and then we would give uh, you can see here the latest developments, which is a snapshot, a one paragraph of what's happening or what's the most recent thing happening in that country. Uh, and the same for uh, a summary for what the access constraints are at the minute. We used to, or what ACAPS used to do, was do this for every sector. So you'd have a summary for all the current, most sector relevant. So everything about shelter would be summarized, everything about wash would be summarized, everything about uh, the political situation used to be summarized in swing court. It's much bigger global overview but they've actually streamlined it now because it, um, it was a lot of work for little awards is what I got told. But I think there was a lot of value in there. It could have been approached slightly differently. But this is the new streamlined version of it. And they also do obviously the risk, which is more towards the anticipatory uh, side of things where they highlight how the situation might change uh, moving forward so people can plan a bit better. Um, so this, that was a global overview. This is what the briefing notes look like um, at the minute. And they, well, they're three pages. This is the first page summary. And it's just, uh, I think you may have seen things similar. I think a lot of the sector is moving to something like this these days, but it's you know, a summary. What is, uh, what actions required by international systems or what is the impact score, uh, which I say is done, that is done very qualitatively by the analyst. The analyst decides that there is no, special algorithm that pumps out that number. It's just decided by several analysts, debate it and agree what that score is going to be. You can see a map, humanitarian constraints, the key priorities and the anticipated scope and scale. Uh, and then it goes into further detail, breaking it into humanitarian conditions uh, and access constraints and whatever else is in their framework. So this is all defined, your briefing note is basically defined by your uh, analytical framework. So you structure your report around your analytical framework. And Federation does have one which is similar to that of ACAP. And then scenario planning, this is what, again, this isn't that whole document, it's a bigger document, like five or six pages, but this is basically what you get as its core component. Four or five scenarios with their probability, their impact, and a, and a short blurb on what that scenario means. Um, and this is the more, from my side, this is the really interesting stuff. For, you can really do a lot with um, your second day review to create that scenario and forecasting stuff, uh, which is less touched on at the minute and could be an area of growth for second day review. 
Um, okay, so I'll end quickly on my vision. Uh, so what, what I see is important is I would like to see a global network of volunteer analysts that provide expertise and insight into current and developing global crises that drive forward data-driven decision-making to ensure the Red Cross Red Crescent can reach the right people at the right time. So we're the Red Cross, we're the largest global network of volunteers, we have people all over the world, and I would really like to start growing the volunteer network of analysts basically to monitor and report on what's happening in the world and crowdsource it. Um, and I think there's a huge potential there to do it. And it's something that at British Red Cross, we're now, well, I've got the green light to at least make the proposal on how we would start approaching something like this. And I know that's why Dan asked me to chat with him the other day is because Dan is looking at how they could also use digital, uh, digital or remote data analysts to be, I don't want to say to Dan what Dan's going to do. He'll tell me off. What are you going to do, Dan? Is that it? With our volunteers? No, I, I, I'll put you on the spot as a, I'm being mean. Uh, but that's me done. Um, so I apologize. I know from my short time in Washington, most Americans have no idea what I'm saying most of the time. Actually, most British people have no idea what I'm saying most of the time. So I hope most of you understood what I was saying. If not, ask away your questions. We can add subtitles later. Yeah, we can edit it, right? I think, thanks, Rich. That was great. Um, learned a lot. Uh, any questions from people on the call? Uh, unmute yourself and feel free to, to speak up. Or you can type it into the chat and we'll read it out. Um, hi, Dan. Rich, thanks a lot for that. This, this is Guido from Geneva, IFRC uh, Geneva. Um, uh, thanks for the presentation, very comprehensive. Uh, one thing um, I wanted to ask, which is this well done feedback on your last point based on the vision, which um, yes, we are the largest network of volunteers, but does, doesn't mean that we need to crowdsource everything to volunteers. Could you explain what was the onboarding and the training that you were exposed to in OCHA and in ACAPS to process second data analysis and for you to master the usage of the analytical framework? How much time did that take of your um, one year in ACAPS before you were able to actually own the whole process from A to Z? Of my life. Um, I'm always learning Guido. Um, but no, so less at uh, OCHA, that was more I was just building on, I'd recently done, finished my master's and been doing some work with regression. So I just took that and I would never recommend really using regression in the humanitarian sector. We do not have strong enough data sets yet. But at ACAPS, um, it's, a, overall it's a 12 month training program, but it's not 12 months to make you the analyst uh, as such. The initial onboarding, you have a two month, um, probation, which varies slightly for people, with the intention of within four weeks you should be in a position to write briefing notes, uh, which is what our core business when we were at ACATS was those briefing notes. So you had a month of, uh, well, you ad hoc, there was minimum training. You got a short, like, hour training on how to tag, and then within guidance, you were assigned a mentor who would review your tagging, provide feedback on all your tagging and your analysis in terms of your uh, global overview. So you, are, you started your global overview straight away you know, from day one, where you tagged and you updated the global overview. But you would have a mentor who monitored what not just your tags, but also what you were analyzing and putting onto that. So you were getting, I guess, constant feedback for the first four weeks on how you were approaching that uh, with that short basic training at the beginning and you also had a training on so then the next training after that would be uh, you were trained on more of the analytical approach of how you would extract that information and write a briefing note uh, and it was more on the process and, and key skills on uh, how to how to word things better to be how to be neutral how to phrase it how to get key information first how to be short and snappy it was we had some really good editors, so I guess the process that I forgot to really mention. Um, we 
all our reports went through an editor at the end. So we had some very good editors who had come from the journalism business. And so they had a lot on how to, how you really wanted to tweak your reports in terms of make sure they were really crisp and clean and presented well, but also how you capture readers with getting your key information in the right place, um, which was very useful. So the first month, um, you just did that. Then by the end of the first month, you had a test. So you were given a fake scenario and you had to do a briefing note and then you were reviewed on that. If you did well, you got feedback. If you did well, you, you passed and you could do briefing notes. So it was wonderful. Uh, and if you didn't, you basically had to just have a bit more training and you would do another practice simulation of a briefing note. And you would do that. where well, you'd only get one more try of that or you'd be fired. Um, but that was how it worked. And then for the rest of the training, you built on other skills. So the whole process of working, just doing the tagging and writing the briefing notes, you decide on the job learning. So you learn how to do it. You get constantly get feedback from the rest of the group. The morning debates where you debate with other people about analysis and what you're seeing in the world it was another way of constantly. And the, the cohorts, you have experienced and non -experienced, less experienced people. So you get to have that shared learning of people who've been doing it for a while, sharing their views or critiquing your analysis of the situation and really pushing you to think more critically. And that was just ongoing. And the final, you got a bit of training on how to do, there was a, at a six month point, it's really when they pushed you into anticipatory and scenario planning where you got more detailed training on that, how to do scenario planning basically. And then you were in a position to, that was always done in a group though. So you were never just given a scenario plan exercise to do on your own. You were always in a team of two or three other analysts, with one of which we experienced on how to do, how to write that report. Um, and that's about it. And then there was other ad hoc trainings throughout the weeks, uh, you know, how to present graphs, how to data viz and all that stuff, um, how to work with quantity or how to work with quality data better, how to aggregate data, different aggregate, aggregation tools you can use to pull in from different data sources. Sorry, I rambled a bit. Is that okay, Guido? <laughs> Yeah, sounds good. And just that then is one of the challenges that we have identified because if we want to create a network of volunteers, um, the understanding and the overall processing of second data, the tagging and the generation of briefing notes is something that requires huge uh, time investment in terms of building those competencies and those skills. So it's just more of a, of a, of a flag to your final slide. But thanks a lot. Over. No, I fully agree, Grido. It's a, it is a, it's a challenge that I'm, I'm trying to work out how we work around and it's potentially having, even having volunteers, like that editor role I was talking about, could you bring someone into that team who, her, whose pure role is to be an editor and a checker of that? But yeah, it's something that I'm currently working on how we get around those challenges working with volunteers as opposed to paid staff um, in terms of time and resources, not the lack of skill or you can't expect someone to work. 35 hours on a briefing note because you don't pay them. But, but even if you pay, it's better to have a small group of volunteers similar to what Dan is doing, very well trained and onboarding from the process from A to Z rather than having 200 people that people don't master the concepts. But anyhow, we can have this conversation and be lots of worries. Over. Thanks. The exact logistics of it are something to be, to be worked out in terms of what that looks like. I'm sure it'll evolve as different national societies try different things and experiment. Uh, with different ways to engage people in this process. So Rich, um, I had a quick question. Uh, can you speak briefly to some of the benefits you see of the Red Cross Network engaging people in this process since there are organizations like ACAPS that exist and are producing these reports already independently of, of what we might take on? Yeah, uh, good question. So, I mean, number one is, um, we are a big network. We have or pretty much a national red cross in every country in the world. There's a, there's a few gaps. Uh, so this is the long-term dream would be we have access to potentially ground information, ground sources uh, that other networks wouldn't have. So if you built this well and you can create a, a way of communicating with the projects on the ground or that's wherever we have national societies on the ground, this is very idealistic, I will say that we would have access, a wider, a broader access to a range of information than other organizations could. Um, 
and having people already distributed across the, the world is more than any ACAPs have what 15 people sat in Geneva and they're very much Geneva context they don't have the broader context that sat outside at an operational level which we could tap into um, I also think I know Rido has just highlighted the challenges of it but we have an opportunity to have a bigger network um, and a, a bigger and more collaborative network across the whole movement and again this will take time it will be hard to, it will be hard to build and have those small dedicated teams across different uh, national societies but I think we have more scope to take this further um, and the final point would be it gives us it sounds we might not read it gives us much more control over the process um, opposed to outsourcing it which is great but ACAPs have it all so we can't like uh, that's they choose how they use and work with that in terms of what they produce uh, and if you wanted to request a briefing note from ACAPs it costs money um, if they, you can use the free the ones they do and they put out for, for public is fine um, but if you wanted to show we want one on this crisis and you're not writing one you have to pay for that um, so we would have control over that and we could choose and focus our work where it's, it's important to us uh, where it adds value to us okay great thank you are there any other questions on the line uh, yeah, this is Luke uh, Cayley uh, from Geneva, from um, the IFRC. So, uh, yeah, thanks, Richard. Um, that's great. It was really interesting to see from the other side. So, so um, one of the products that you showed was the briefing notes, the anticipatory briefing notes. And uh, we, in the Start Network, when I was working there, uh, commissioned those. And it was impressive work, very quick and delivered, you know, normally to time. Um, within, like, 24 hours, they were really useful as a kind of initial surface level um, but comprehensive um, overview of a situation. But then what we had was uh, a few decisions, which were you know, decision kind of forum where we would uh, decide on whether uh, we'd release funding, what kind of uh, activities um, we would um, you know, release that funding for, and make some recommendations for the uh, NGOs that were working on the gr on the ground. Um, so my question is about how you would. What, what do you see as the kind of entry points for these kinds of products in the IFRC or, you know, broader Red Cross movement um, uh, system? Um, which, which kind of uh, decisions would you be serving with these uh, briefing uh, products? All right. um, yeah, so, I mean, the way I'm currently looking at this, uh, I do see there's a lot of potential to grow it outside um, beyond just a national society uh, and to have it as a network tool. And I've obviously said that in my vision. Where I see it right now, and I, I feel it would build from, I see a lot of value in, say, the British Red Cross, but our regional, in international, we have regional teams who work in projects across many, many countries. Um, but we don't really have, I don't know how many PRs you get to what this, we don't have a very strong way of uh, analyzing, A, the situations in the countries where we choose to work, or planning or forecasting for the future development or investment of our projects. So just at a BRC level, being able to offer our program teams um, scenario planning for a country they're currently in or a region they're working in so where they can plan where they're gonna send or develop their projects over the next year, two years, would add a lot of value to our national society's uh, programming. So that would be, that's the reason I'm trying to develop this at BRC is to create more of a uh, planning tool to use it as a, I guess, a program planning tool or program planning uh, support tool for um, our programs in international. The the wider network uh, and outside that, I guess it gets a lot more complicated. But again, I don't see like scenario planning at a regional level would be really interesting. The stuff you guys did at Federation for the Ebola crisis, I think that was a really good report and could demonstrate like, we should have more of that. We should be looking at how a crisis might shift and change. Um, we should be able to offer that or give that to our regions so they can find better uh, at a Federation level. And even the one we can do, which I've talked about a lot in my debriefs, if anyone uh, has been bored enough to listen, from Mozambique would be the initial assessment stuff that we're pushing, that's been pushed through the reference group, um, that really is something at uh, international federation level, it's something that we can 
push onto a remote team, we can do those initial assessments and second day reviews with a remote team and give that to operations as the teams are hitting the ground trying to respond to those situations. Uh, as we saw, we, you know, it was sort of tested, as you know, Luke, in, in Mozambique, we had that deep team giving us that information. But if they'd been giving you that initial assessment, that would be really cool to have and even to have supporting uh, more, di you know, more directly in terms of creating other sections of reports for us or even writing that whole situational analysis so we can focus on that actual analyzing the primary data company. I don't know if that really answered. I think there is a lot of questions and unknowns out there on how we would, what this might look like when it's moved forward. And that's why I'm really trying to focus on the be I know the benefits it can bring to BRC. And that's why I'm trying to push it in my natural society. And hopefully then it can expand from there. Great. Thanks, you, Rich. Um, so we're a little bit past the scheduled time. Um, if anybody has additional questions, you can email them to me and if I'll aggregate any of them and get them answered and send them back out to the group. Um, thanks for joining anyone and thanks again, Rich, for taking the time to present on your experiences and, and share your knowledge with us. No worries, anytime. I hope it was useful. Thanks, Dan. Okay. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>